As ons kyk na die thema's, wat inspireer jou? Wat maak dat jy na het thema van uitstelling kyk of na? Wat, wat is het wat jou maak teken? Um, it's a strange thing to say. As a child, as I said, I would have drawn the world around me. Mm. And nothing has really changed except because I'm by nature not a lazy person, but I need a little bit of a, a kick to get me going. I tend to work with the things that make me angry. I'm driven the strongest by a reaction to something, to things that anger me. Much of my work has dealt with injustice and mm-hmm. violence and aggression and, and things that unfortunately our country is so full of. And it's it's kind of a purging process. When something really angers me, the best way, and it's again relates to how I worked with it when I was a child, you draw it out of yourself. By drawing something, it becomes tangible and real, and you can face it and deal with it. Um, and nothing's really changed. So much of my work, I mean, I think it's a little bit more, um, what's the right way of saying, more specific now or more specialised. Well, I'll, I'll look at a certain project, perhaps um, I did some drawings one or two years ago and I was looking at people in all their terms mm-hmm. um, and then drawing them in the ashes of the books that had mattered to them. But again, it was driven by a sense of, of anger. It was based on a very good friend of mine who'd gone to stay in an old age home. And I went there to visit her. And it was, it really angered me the way, well, it upset me. It reminded me of going to the SPCA. Because yet people in little boxes, and if you walk down the hall, the number of grannies who turned around to look to the door to see right. if you'd come to see them was something that really bugged me. And it was based on that. So again, I work with very strong emotive um, things. If, if something upsets me or emotively makes me respond, that tends to be what I work with. Yeah. As you have a slight of so the outdoors, can you in a kair make mental notes? Name your photos. What your works process? In terms of that project, because I specifically wanted to work with old age pensioners, people who were prepared to allow me to photograph them, mm-hmm. I'd have taken a camera. But my brain tends to take visual notes all the time. Um, I think one just tends to be a visual person or a, a verbal person or a sound-based person. I'm constantly looking. It, it's sort of like a, a subtext to mm-hmm. my way of thinking. I'm constantly recording and thinking. So when I would have gone to that, all the time I am looking, I'm noticing things. But then specifically for those drawings, because they needed to be quite um, accurate in the ash, I worked with the camera and documented the, the, the sitters. Um, but I think it's just as a visual communicator, you're always looking, mm. you're always recording, yeah. And maybe also because it was from the kids of the case. Was. So, with other words, you can now my eyes look at and you saw lots of them. Yeah, I can probably draw you fairly well. Not not accurate enough that maybe uh, you're going to be happy with it, but enough of a sense of. Uh, when I work with my students, I always say memory is quite selective. Mm-hmm. It distorts things, but it focuses on the elements that were important to you. So if I remember somebody and they were quite uh, maybe emaciated or thin, you're going to over-exaggerate that because whatever quality of that is, your your brain tends to focus on. Mm. And I find that far more interesting than just a straight photographic replica. I mean, we've got cameras, we've got amazing recording devices. Why just try and emulate them? You're, you're competing against the impossible. But one's memory allows that selective focus that you can hone in on that aspect of that person. Maybe it was just, and again, I come back to the old age pensioners that I worked with, and the one woman had these very beautiful hands, and the veins were these, these very pretty blue highways down. And all I can remember from her is actually her really long, very fine hands, and thinking, wow, she must have had... And it's something as selective as that. Mm. And I think it's that, when you can transfer it into a work, that brings that personal response, that perhaps takes an artwork, a, a drawn work to another position where a photographic image doesn't necessarily go. Mm. Om terug te kom weer by die oude thuis, het die thema, dit wat jou kwaad maak, het dit een invloed op die medium wat jou op die oude gebruik? I think one has more of a clinical approach to that. I mean, this, this person who I was friends with eventually died, um, uh, as, as is inevitable for all of us, and I was aware of it, it's a proverb, I think, or a saying, um, when an old person dies, it's like a whole library burning down. Mm. And that was what's the key. So often it's words that sit off keys. And I was thinking, because to her, books were incredibly important. She moved her entire little body of books with her and, and all the rest of it. And I remember thinking, it, it's accumulated wisdom. It's a lifetime's wisdom 
that's lost with the death of someone. And just by kind of osmosis, the idea came of drawing people in the words that they used, or the words that were important to them, became the ashes with which I drew them, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. what I would do is I'd, I'd do the interviews when I was speaking to the people in the old HMs, and then ask them to give me a list of books that had mattered to them in their lives. Wow. And then if I could, because that's what took almost the longest time, was scouring through secondhand bookshops, trying to find copies of those books and then burning them and then finding that most books actually produce exactly the same quality of ash. didn't matter if I was doing sort of War and Peace or, you know, Barbara Cartland, you got a kind of very similar ash. Yeah. But then staying true to that, of drawing them in the ashes of their own words. I did a later series um, working with retired academics in Pretoria. Yeah. And then drawing them in the ashes of things that they'd written. Oh. I would love to. Can you imagine drawing the previous apartheid government in the ashes of the... Um, of the laws that they're structured on. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? So it's literally using the words yeah. mm. of the people to, to produce them. Yeah. As we talk about your photographic brain, what you mm. have, schakel you ooit af? Want I can not think what's a macht om prentjies dwarrel in your kop rond. No, you don't. I don't think you do, but you learn to not be totally and utterly distracted by it. Um, if I'm traveling on my own, which is something I really enjoy doing, you go into, you stop talking because you're not with people mm. and I go totally into a visual it, it's like a totally different headspace mm. everything becomes sight orientated so your, your eyes become the priority where if you're dealing with students all the time you're listening you're listening to what they're saying as opposed to what they mean um, so that that element comes in but I think as a visual person you're constantly recording you're constantly just or selectively looking for little details that, that, that get recorded and stored I've said to people before and I think my brain is a lot like a sponge it absorbs absolutely everything and then I don't tend to plan my work that well it's one of the reasons why I'm often getting into trouble being late with stuff because it takes a long time to produce them um, and then the ideas leak back out again often not in the order you'd anticipated but it's only after you've drawn them you realize oh okay so that's what that was about it's a very strange process it's a kind of self-reflective thing as well, which is amazing. You get to understand your own headspace by drawing images out of it or allowing them to, to leak out of your head, I think is, is a better way of putting it.